Now, some important questions we get about this. Acer says preparation courses are a waste of time. They don't say that, and this is exactly what they say on the website. They do not recommend or endorse any commercially available knowledge as Acer have knowledge of the content of such courses, thus they're unable to comment. Now, somebody at the last seminar we ran here said that they were at a HPAT information evening run by Acer, and um, that, they, you know, according to, the, now I'm getting it as hearsay, so this may not have happened at all, but the person that came to the last seminar said to me, uh, that he asked the guy the question from Acer about preparation courses and apparently the guy said, quote unquote, they're a complete waste of time. However, the actual review that has been done by the working group, quote unquote, has actually said that people who do preparation courses perform better. Right, and that's actually empirically researched. Now there's also even a thing about your mindset. If you're that dedicated that you're actually going to do some sort of structured preparation, um, you would suspect that you know people are going to do better anyway. All right. So again, the interim report it said the HPAT Ireland scores of candidates who avail of commercial courses are higher than those who did not, and that's because of the fact that anybody who applies for medicine, when you apply in the CAO, you may notice you have a little thing to sign, which basically says that your data can be used by the working group in order for them to conduct analysis on the HPAT, and that's what they've done with the 2009 and 2010 uh, cohort. And they basically surveyed them, said, did you do a preparation course? And for all those that ticked yes, they looked at their results in contrast to people who ticked no. So, you know, I would suggest to you that, of course, the guy from Acer is going to say that, you know, he has as much a vested interest as I do. What you have to try and do is figure out in between those two vested interests, which is the one that uh, you want to consider or rely on. Okay? All right. Um, in relation to another question, we get preparation courses a waste of time because Acer, my friend, someone on boards that I.e., the neighbor's dog says that you can't prepare for the HPAT. You quite clearly can. Again, a proposal from the working group was that practice and uh, preparation material would be increased. They've shown that people perform better who attend courses. And again, the thing that's very, very important because I've got this before is that an awful lot of people, if you ask them on the spot, what does the A in HPAT stand for? An awful lot of people would say aptitude. And then they'll start into a big rant about, you can't prepare for an aptitude test. Aptitude is innate. Well, think of section one of the HPAT. It's logical reasoning and problem solving. If you can't improve somebody's ability to logically reason and solve a problem, what's the point in doing medicine? Are you basically saying at the end of your six year degree, you're no better able to reason and problem solve than you were when you started? So this thing that you can't actually develop somebody's aptitude you know, that aptitude is just completely innate, is a complete falsehood, all right? Sure, you need to have a certain amount of raw, innate talent, but even the best athletes in the world have to train, okay? Now, obviously, somebody who has no athletic ability to start with can't be made into an Olympic athlete, but somebody who has some ability, some raw talent, they need to hone that and perfect it, okay? So that's what I would say in relation to that is, and I just generally think, I don't think there's any test that you can't prepare for. I don't know, you know, what set of circumstances could they develop a test that you can't actually prepare for if you're going to get some sort of idea of what's being tested. Okay, um, is this a course that focuses on practicing countless questions or is there any focus on technique? We focus an awful lot on technique and I'm hopefully going to prove that with some of the examples I'm going to do with you now, um, is that technique is vital and technique is very, very useful. And then you may have seen this, um, some uh, questions on HPAP preparation courses are not similar to those in the actual exam. So when we were developing the course here, we made sure that we actually benchmarked it against standard. You may be aware of the fact that the HPAT is just following international best practice. Uh, the UMAT has been in existence for decades in Australia and in New Zealand. And again, you know, the material that we use is benchmarked against the UMAT in New Zealand and Australia, the HPAT Ulster, which was obviously in before the HPAT Ireland, etc. But it's an important thing for you to ask because I've seen some material from, from certain um, um, sources um, where, for example, the number of answers in a question is not reflective of the exam. And people will say, what harm? It makes a big difference. In section one, there are four answers to pick from. In section two, there are four answers. And in section three, there are five answers to pick from. And you should practice according to what you're actually going to do in the exam. So it is important to make sure that the stuff that you're practicing is reflective of the nature of the challenge that you're going to face on the day. Which section is the most difficult? Now I mentioned this earlier on, there's a bit of debate about this. It depends, okay, it depends. Um, just to give you one, one example on that, and I don't think he mentioned, minds this at all, 
Um, he's obviously one of the people that has done one of our testimonials. Uh, the first year that we ran the HPAT, we didn't run it in, in the first two iterations. Um, uh, one of our students scored 217 in the HPAT. But the interesting thing was he scored a perfect score in section two. He got 100 in section two. 100 out of 100. Now, how did he do that? Well, he did that obviously because he has a very, very strong sense of interpersonal understanding. He would have a very high level of emotional intelligence. And the reason behind that was because he was actually a qualified pharmacist. Now, I'm not making this up uh, because initially when he said it to me, he was asking me about the HPAT and doing the course, I said to him, should you not be considering doing the GAMSAT because you already have a pharmacology degree and you're actually working as a pharmacist? And he had a very logical and reasoned explanation why he didn't want to go that route, uh, which I, I just briefly mentioned, the whole idea about problem-based learning. He didn't want to do a medicine degree using problem-based learning. So he said what he wanted to do was do a medical degree from the beginning, starting with the same with everybody else, and he was quite prepared to do that. But imagine somebody who's a qualified pharmacist working in a pharmacy, dealing with, with people on a daily basis, worried about their prescriptions, worried about the side effects, worried about the cost of the medicine. So his level of emotional intelligence and his empathy would have been very, very sophisticated. So that's why somebody like that can score so well in Section 2. So to a certain extent, there is a little bit of structure and a little bit of guidance you can give people for Section 2. But if, regardless of gender, you're somebody who may not be as emotionally developed as you, you might be in a year or two, you're going to find Section 2 a little bit challenging. But it is something that you can actually focus on and improve. You know, you do it naturally in your life anyway. So just with a bit of structure and a little bit of, a, of, a, of, a, of focus on it, you can do it. Section 3, some people, because they have maybe concentrated on languages or, let's say, the classics in terms of subjects in school, they mightn't be quite good at that technical stuff, or as maybe somebody who did woodwork and technical drawing finds Section 3 incredibly easy. But again, it's just a simple question of technique. All right? you know, there's nothing to stop you know, a female student you know, being able to you know, change the oil filter or change the wheel in a car. It's just that they're kind of conditioned not to do that type of stuff. You know? But there's absolutely nothing to stop them. They have the skills to do it when they put their mind to it. So again, very, very similar with, the, with that section. It all depends on where you're coming from. Okay, so that's the idea behind that. Now, any other questions before we have a, a go at some, some of the questions, some of the practice questions? If anybody has a question, I'll just repeat it so everybody else can hear it and hear the answer. All right, yeah, go ahead, if I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it's a very good question, and we're actually going to do it now. So the question was, will you have any paper, scrap paper, or rough work in the exam? You actually won't. And one of the questions we're going to practice here, it's again another thing that you have to practice and prepare for, is you have to be able to actually do all your rough work on the booklet. Um, Acer are terrified uh, about uh, questions getting out. Uh, so that's why, for example, in, in the UMAT in Australia and New Zealand as well, no scrap paper is allowed because at one stage there were actually unscrupulous um, uh, tuition companies in those countries paying people to do the exam, but they weren't really doing it. They were just writing down the questions on the scrap paper and taking the questions out of the exam hall. So there's absolutely no scrap paper whatsoever. You have the booklet, which has ample room for you to, to uh, write and make notes. Um, and then you just have your bubble sheet, which is kind of like a lotto panel for you to actually co color in uh, the right answer for what you think is the right answer for each question. So yeah, that's another skill that you have to develop. But if you look at the practice booklets, you'll see there is ample room between the questions for you to make notes and stuff like that. But it's just something to prepare for. Don't be practicing using scrap paper because you're not going to be able to use it on the day. You should kind of practice as close to reality as you can. And that's something we certainly promote on the course um, by actually trying to simulate as closely as possible even the font of the actual uh, booklets that you'll get on the day. Okay, anybody else? Any other questions? This lady, yeah? Yes, so this, this question about the Acer booklets being the same. Um, I've gone on and bought the online version of this idea now of the, of the online one, and it's exactly the same. Um, I think it's, it's booklet, uh, booklet 2, which is the light blue one. Uh, booklet 1 is the one that kind of has a lilac colour on it. And also watch out for the fact some people have bought the UMAT practice booklets. They're exactly the same. They're exactly the same. The UMAT practice booklets and the, Acer, or the um, HPAT ones are exactly the same. So um, now I'm going to wait and see when the second electronic version of the, the practice booklet comes available. I'll be buying that too. So I'll, I'll let people know if it is actually different or if it is new. But up until now, it's just been two. And in fact, in the first two sittings, there was only one practice booklet. We were kind of lucky to get the second one. Anybody, any other ones? 
I'll stay around anyway after the presentation at the end if anybody wants to ask me any individual questions. Okay, now what we're going to do now is distribute these, um, these little units, okay? So fairly intuitive. Um, there won't be one for everyone, so we'll get a chance to share them around. I'll just explain very simply what you do is you take the unit, you hold the on-off button, which is on the top left-hand corner, you hold that down for about five seconds. You'll see it will actually go seeking, okay? Uh, searching for session ID and it'll go ready, all right? When I then actually put up the multiple choices for the questions that you're actually going to uh, vote your answer as such, what will happen is you'll see that the, the letters will display. Now this is the bit where it's a little bit counterintuitive. It's almost like the keypad on a Sony Ericsson's phone. Okay, so you have the little scroll buttons here to navigate up and down. But watch out, in contrast to the Sony Ericsson phone, you don't select by pressing the middle button. In other words, you'd scroll up and down with the two top up, up and down cursor. You actually pick the one over on the, on the uh, top right. Okay, so scroll up and down to pick the letter you want to vote on. And then the one on the top right here is the one you actually, uh, when you've selected the one you want, that's how you cast your vote. Your unit will tell you whether you've got it right or wrong. And then when everyone has voted, I'll graph the results and you'll get an idea to see how you're, how you're doing with your cohort. Is that okay? Now, if anybody has any problems while we're getting it up and running, I'll float around to make sure that, uh, that everybody gets an opportunity to use it because this is one of the, the unique selling points we have about our course because, again, I'm sure you're aware of this. Most people are of the opinion, it's just that Acer won't definitely say it, is that the questions are not marked equally. And therefore, it is very, very important for you to figure out how are you doing, not just on a question-by-question -question basis, but are you getting difficult ones right or just easy ones right. Okay, so... The first two questions I'm going to get you to do, we'll, we'll do with um, these units and then we'll ask people to, to pass them around. Okay, I'll just come down the middle here if I can. Okay, so everybody should get a go. 